Hey, howdy all, welcome on into Goose Talks Film, where we talk about anything and everything film, where we do movie reviews every single week, and sometimes we do a double feature, and luckily for you guys, this week is one of those weeks. So I've already reviewed Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which was released on Friday night, and today we are recording Roadhouse 2024, the remake starring Jack Tillenhall, directed by Doug Lyman. Lehman, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, but yeah, we're here reviewing that today. So... Uh, depending on when you were born, you know, what generation you are, what era you were born in, uh, Roadhouse is a remake of a 1989 movie starring the late, great Patrick Swayze. Uh, very iconic movie for its time. Like, it literally, although it's late 80s, leading into the 90s, it literally lives and breathes the 80s. It's definitely a product of its time, good and bad. So, when this was announced, I think I, th- I first heard a couple of years ago um, that this was being made. Uh, I, I was a bit surprised, only, you know, there's so many other action movies and all that that maybe could have been remade or even just, I don't know, sequels made. So this kind of caught me by surprise because I'd known of Roadhouse because I have a dad that was born in, you know, the early to mid 60s. And so, you know, he loves 80s action movies and 90s, but specifically 80s because he's obviously younger. Those are the types of movies that he watched. So I knew Roadhouse and um, both my parents are Patrick Swayze fans. So I obviously knew about uh, Patrick Swayze's Roadhouse because this was just after Dirty Dancing and Patrick Swayze was one of the biggest names in Hollywood at the time. And it's quite an iconic movie. Um, I won't by any means say it's an amazing movie. I didn't actually get the chance to watch it before watching the remake starring Jake Gyllenhaal, which is a shame because I would have liked to compare him. But I know it's not always fair to compare, but... When you're remaking a movie, that's the expectations and the bar that you have to meet because that's just how it is. If you want to remake a movie and use a pre-existing IP and try and get you know uh, money and people talking about it, then you know that's the price you pay. But yeah, no. So we're here to talk about 2024 Roadhouse. I won't. Um, I won't dwell on the the original too much. Maybe a few comparisons here and there, but. Yeah, I won't dwell on on the comparison too much. So, yeah, Uh, this Roadhouse is um, pretty much a ex-UFC fighter who, uh, yeah, did some very, very bad things in the ring. Is now just like a, I don't know what you would call him, like he just, he travels, he lives in his car, he hasn't got a job. He pretty much just takes these pit fighting jobs, but everyone's too scared to fight him. Uh, And then, yeah, he gets hired to be a bouncer. Uh, in the Florida Keys, which is, you know, like a big touristy place, so, you know, on the beach, uh, for a, pl- a roadhouse called Roadhouse. Uh, and, yeah, it's not all what it seems, and he gets himself into some trouble. But that's all I'll talk about the plot uh, while we're in the spoiler-free zone. Uh, but, yeah, so I'll just talk about it a little bit before we uh, spoil the shit out of this movie. So this is was released on uh, Amazon Prime. I think it was Thursday night here in Australia. It was released. Uh, quite surprisingly, so watching this, I know that we would have had to have a substantial budget. Um, his budget is actually $85 million, and he went straight to streaming on Amazon Prime, obviously. What I found really interesting whilst I was doing research about this movie is that the, the company, I'm not sure if it was the production company or uh, the distributing company or both or oh, I'm just not sure but they approached the film- filmmaker and said you got two options 60 million dollar budget and it goes to theatrical or 85 million and it goes straight to streaming so they actually offered them a bigger budget to go straight to streaming now that obviously saves them a bit of money in distribution and a bit more marketing than you would for a streaming movie obviously because they can just stream it on uh, sorry, stream the trailers and stuff and advertise it through Amazon Prime on Facebook and blah, blah, blah. So not having to... Majority of the time when you're doing a theatrical movie, they create all these social media accounts just for the movie and pretty much once the movie is released, they kind of just die on the ass. Whereas if you're releasing a movie through Netflix or Amazon Prime, whatever, they just advertise everything in-house. So if you already follow Amazon Prime on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, etc., you're going to see these trailers and all this promotional stuff. So I guess for them, they were able to offer a bigger budget so it'd be cheaper for them and easier. So it's kind of the world we live in at the moment where 
these streaming companies and stuff will do this type of thing to make it easier for them and um, what have you. But yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, it's almost hit 100 mil for the budget, which I think, um, yeah, surprises me. Not from watching the movie because watching it, I knew it would have a uh, good production budget and value. But this being an action remake of a 1989 cult classic movie, but it's a cult classic kind of in a bad sense that it's, it's bad that it's good. Um, but also Patrick Swayze being in it obviously helped, especially for the time. But yeah, I was really surprised this got greenlit and was given $85 million. Because, I mean, if this was released theatrical, I don't see it making a shit ton of money. So, I think they probably made the right call releasing it on streaming. Because when you release a movie, everything is kind of based on its ter- uh, first two and three weeks of release at cinemas. That's kind of where you're going to make the chunk of your profit. Unless you're a big, big budget movie like June Part 2 where that will continue to make money for the next few weeks. You know, about six, seven weeks in total. Not all movies are like that. Majority movies aren't. So I guess with streaming, it's kind of like okay, we'll release this movie in March on March twenty first, and we'll um, look back back at it in July and see what the numbers are looking like, and see if it's going to pick up more, blah blah blah. So that's the thing with streaming is it's always going to be there. If it's made by Prime, it's always going to be on Prime. So I guess to them, it's like well, it's always going to get eyes on products, always going to get views. But once you release a movie it's theatrical, then you know, it's his first three weeks, three to four weeks usually, and then you rely on, um, used to be physical release, but now, unfortunately, more digital release. But, yeah, um, so I'll talk about the, a little bit about the movie that, um, doing spoilers. So, uh, yeah, it's, look, it's a good, fun action movie. Uh, you know, if you're looking for something with a lot of substance and maybe an action movie that's a bit different, this won't be for you. Uh it is your typical cliche action movie, uh, even though it's a remake. You know, we see a lot of remakes of different genre films not always be cliche and not always have to be a copy and paste product. Now, this isn't a copy and paste of the original by any means. Um, probably only borrows a few things and really is different in a lot of ways. But like I said, if you're going to remake a movie, then you're always going to have higher expectations than an original movie. Because sometimes people just watch watch an original movie and be like, oh, you know, this is good because it's original. It's different. Bit of breath of fresh air. Not all original movies are like that. But when you're watching a remake, it's like, okay, is this going to be as good as the original? Is it going to be worse? Is it going to be better? What are they going to change? Do they gonna improve things? Are they going to make things worse? And that's always questions you ask with the remake. So it's always ballsy for people to take on uh, remakes and stuff. But... Doug Lyman, look, you know, he's a very, very experienced director. He directed the cult hit Swingers in 96. He directed the original Born Identity, and he actually executive produced the rest in the franchise. So, massive, you know, one of the, probably one of the biggest action franchises uh, since the 90s. Uh, sorry, early 2000s. Then he directed Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, probably my favorite movie of his, uh, 2008 Jumper, which has become a cult movie. Uh, Fair Game, which was nominated for a Palme d'Or. Um, a lot of people's favorite Tom Cruise movie, 2014's Edge of Tomorrow. Uh, the Wall, which starred Aaron Taylor-Johnson and uh, John Cena, which was also an Amazon Studios movie. Another Tom Cruise movie called American Made. Uh, 2021's massive box office bomb, Chaos Walking. And this is Roadhouse. So he's had quite an interesting career. A few ups and downs, you know, he's dabbled in sci-fi, he's dabbled in action comedy, he's dabbled in action, he's dabbled in just full-on drama, adventure action. So, yeah, no, he's, look, look, he he's experienced a lot of the, his movies are well-directed, so I knew heading into this that it was going to at least be, you know, watchable and fun in parts. Um, now, I usually recommend a movie out of three categories, it's usually... Go see this at the movies, wait until streaming, or don't bother at all. Obviously, it's a bit hard with a straight-to-streaming movie. Um, a bit like Damsel on Netflix, I was actually going to cover, but I actually got really sick that week and couldn't really talk, so I had to can that one. But uh, yeah, well, a quick night on Damsel. If you've got a spare afternoon, about two hours on a rainy day, we're heading into winter now, it could be a good option, but don't rush to see it. Anyway, back to Roadhouse. So yeah, Roadhouse is a bit different. What I will say is... Uh, if you're looking for just two hours of action, uh, with 
you know, really good fight scenes, some good action scenes, some pretty decent acting. You're a big Jack Dylan Hall fan, and this is for you. This probably won't disappoint if you hit one or all of those markers I just brought up. Um, if you're a film junkie and you know you love your artsy stuff and your Oscar worthy movies and stuff, this definitely isn't for you. Uh, it is on Prime Video, and I always say that uh, in terms of bang for your buck and what. Uh, is worth what you pay. You know, nowadays, I'm, you know, I'm paying sixteen dollars for Stan. I'm I'm going to be paying eighteen dollars a month for Disney Plus. Uh, I think the most worth money. Uh, if you're a horror fan, is Shutter. I pay about six seven dollars a month for Shutter. Great content. It's just horror based. It's not going to be for everyone. And then Amazon Prime. Um, I was originally paying five six dollars when it first hit, and I loved it because it had a lot of older stuff, a lot of a lot of things that um, other streaming services would never get. And I think I'm still paying less than $10 for Prime Video. So, look, if you're looking for something to add to your list and maybe get a free month for Prime, this could be a good, good option for you to watch whilst you've got your free month or just commit to Prime Video. I'll, I'll always vouch for Prime Video, always. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much all I'll really say um, about this movie in the spoiler-free territory. Um, if you're umming and ahhing about watching it, um, then maybe don't watch it. If I think if you're going to watch it, I think you know if you're going to watch it. It's not one of those ones where you're like, oh, oh, you know, oh, oh, you're umming and ahhing, and then go, oh, okay, I'll watch it. And then you're pleasantly surprised. But I think it's going to go the other way. I think you'll be like, oh, oh, yeah, no, I'll watch it. And then you'll be like, oh, why did I waste, you know, two hours watching that? So if you are umming and ahhing, maybe don't watch it. But if you want to watch an action movie and you're thinking about watching this and you're just waiting for spare time, well, that's the good thing about new release movies on streaming. If you maybe aren't free until next weekend to watch it, it's only been out a week on streaming. You're not going to get any spoilers. You're not going to have to worry about session times or anything like that. Boom. Put it on. Watch it in your comfort of your own home and enjoy it for two hours. But that's what I will say uh, for the spoiler-free territory. So here's a warning. They're going to spoil the shit out of this movie and we'll delve into it a bit deeper. Alrighty. So the uh, spoiler-riddled Full synopsis has been released, so as I always do, well, when I try to do it, I will, yeah, read the full synopsis, so bear with me, it's probably going to take a couple of minutes. So, troubled former UFC middleweight fighter Elwood Dalton makes a living scamming fighters on the underground circuit. He's approached by Frankie, the owner of an unruly roadhouse in the Florida Keys community of Glass Key, who offers him a job as head bouncer. Initially hesitant, Dalton takes up the offer after narrowly averting a suicide attempt with a freight train that destroys his car. He takes a coach bus to Frankie's establishment simply called The Roadhouse and befriends Charlie, a teenager who runs a bookstore with her father, Stephen. At The Roadhouse, Dalton fends off a motorcycle gang working for local crime boss, Ben Brandt, and personally drives the injured thugs to the hospital where he meets Ellie, a doctor who tends his injuries. Staying in Frankie's disused houseboat, Dalton mentors other bouncers and becomes popular with the locals. After an attempt on his life by gang leader Dell, Dalton finds him, him finds him lying in wait at his houseboat. He throws Dell overboard, but is unable to save him from being killed and eaten by a crocodile that ate the previous owner's Pomeranian dog. Knox, a recently released okay, that makes no sense. Knox, a recently released from prison mafia enforcer and brazen nudist, is tasked by Brant's incarcerated father to hunt down Dalton. After an unexpected date with Ellie. Dalton is threatened by Sheriff Big Dick to leave town, but Dalton refuses and is ordered out of Big Dick's patrol vehicle at gunpoint and assaulted by his uniformed goons, but is rescued by Ellie, who is revealed to be the Sheriff's daughter. She explains that her father is in league with Brant, who has inherited his father's drug empire. Brant meets Dalton at the roadhouse and taunts him about his past. In a UFC title fight against a friend, Dalton was overcome with rage and killed his opponent in the octagon. Knox arrives with Brant's men in an all-out bar bar fight ensues, leaving Dalton badly beaten. Frankie admits that Brent has been buying up property to build an expensive resort, but she is the lone holdout. Dalton decides to leave town, but discovers that Charlie and Stephen are in hospital after Brant's men burn down their bookstore. In rage, Dalton kills one of the thugs responsible and captures a sheriff's deputy, making a large delivery of Brant's illicit cash, framing the deputy for the murder and taking the money. The sheriff soon informs Dalton that Brant has kidnapped Ellie and will exchange her for, her mo- for the money. Stealing Ellie's former boyfriend's motorboat to reach Brant's catamaran yacht, Dalton finds him with Big Dick, revealing that kidnapping was a ploy to lure Dalton aboard 
admonishing Dalton for his obliviousness to the cuteness of locals. But Brant rebukes Big Dick that he's actually holding Ellie hostage with Big Dick scorning Brant for his paternal protectiveness. Tempest flare as Knox approaches in his boat, but Dalton detonates a bomb on Ellie's former boyfriend's boat and finds Ellie below deck, returning with her and attempting to escape together. Brant recaptures Ellie in the motorboat while Knox attempts to finish Dalton in a, in a skiff boat. During the struggle on the skiff boat, Dalton is catapulted onto Brant's boat and Dalton and Ellie jump off the driverless boat that collides directly into the roadhouse. Catapulting Brant onto the roadhouse and critically injuring him, Dalton follows into the roadhouse to finish off Brant. Climbing onto a causeway, Knox hijacks a pickup truck and crashes it into the roadhouse, interrupting Dalton and attempts to finish him off. They engage in an intense fight with Knox brutally beats and stabs Dalton. An injured Brant gets up moments later and orders Knox to kill the critically injured Dalton, but Knox fatally snaps Brant's neck due to being annoyed by him. Attempting to finish off Dalton with a shard of wood, Dalton instead gains the upper hand and repeatedly stabs Knox fatally. The sheriff arrives agreeing to cover up for Dalton and orders him to leave town. As the Glass Key community rebuilds following the aftermath, Charlie bids farewell to Dalton, awaiting his coach bus out of town. Stephen discovers Dalton has left them the trunk of cash that he took from the deputy and is too late to thank him as the bus pulls away. In a mid-credit mid- scene, Knox, revealed to have survived the fight, assaults hospital staff as he leaves wearing only a hospital gown. The end. So, yeah. As you can tell, um, yeah. It's <laughs> not... Oh, look, I don't want to be too negative and... I find myself probably being a bit too positive on some movies that I've realised now looking at back um, ratings and, and whatnot. Oh, God, being the main one, but that was my first podcast. So I think I was just being a bit too positive and just comparing some of the ratings um, post-recordings and stuff. It's just, I have definitely been a bit too kind on a, on a few movies, like comparing them to other ones. They are much better, but there's not much of a difference in the ratings. So I think I have to be more stricter. Um, yeah, look... The, it definitely started off uh, leaning into the 80s action after Jack Gyllenhaal, Dalton, um, doesn't fight uh, in the pit, but everyone's scared of him, so he gets the money anyway. Uh, he just pretty much does that a lot by the sounds of it, by what he said, that he knows he's got a reputation and people majority of the time don't fight him, so he just wins by default, and that's how he makes his living pretty much. But someone gets shitty that, he made them lose money, so they stab him, and he doesn't react. And he just goes, "Are you sure you want to do this?" And the guy runs off scared. Like that's that's your eighties action right there. Like that's you can't get more eighties action than that. <laughs> like, you really can't. So definitely lead into that, and that's kind of the one of the only um big. I don't want to say a callback, but a big maybe shout out to eighties action movies, and obviously knowing where Roadhouse comes from. Um. Yeah. So that just after that scene, he he parks on the train tracks, and at, at as this point, we don't know much really about him as a person or a character, and he just parks in the middle of the train tracks, knowing there's a train coming, and then he changes his mind last minute, but he has trouble with his car, and he gets hit and flipped. But um, so it's kind of like conflicting what they're trying to tell us. Like, is he suicidal or was he? indecisive about it or like that's and it's confusing once you watch the movie like that's one of the only times it really comes off as him being suicidal slash depressed or anything like that like he's obviously a a loner he's sad and he hasn't got a lot of friends and he's a bit like Jack Reacher in the fe- in the sense that he doesn't own anything and he travels a lot and only has light luggage and whatnot so it's kind of confusing because I don't really touch on that suicide attempt, really. Um, so that's kind of left to be open, which was a bit weird. Uh, yeah, look, he, Jake Gyllenhaal does good, does a, a quite a good job in this. Um, he's not really playing a character he hasn't really before. It's kind of an, like an amalgamation of different characters he's played and borrowed from here and there, which is fine. A lot of actors do that. Not you can't be hundred percent original character every time. Once you've had a career like Jake, he's been acting for well over twenty years now. So. I know it's hard, but it definitely like and his physique, like he he hasn't been probably this bulked up um since Southpaw, but he's probably a lot more shredded in this. He was probably bulkier in Southpaw, but so we we've seen him put in the work. We know that he can get fit and, and he looks really impressive here, so hats off to him. Uh yeah, look, 
before I delve into the movie itself too much, I just want to say, like, a lot of movies should stay in the 80s. Um, that's why I've always been against, you know, remakes of Back to the Future, Police Academy, Ghostbusters, um, and a few others. Like, 80s is, in terms of music and movies, and, you know, in a lot of ways, fashion, like, it's hard to get things out of that decade and throw it into 2024 and it's going to stick. And if you try and change it to fit today's um, mold, so to speak, it, it it's going to shy away too much from what it is. So, you might as well do something original. That's what I'm against 80s a lot. And, and look, I'm not acting like the original Roadhouse is a masterpiece and an Academy Award winning film. Like, we know it's not. It's also got its problems, which makes me think, like, did Roadhouse really need a remake? Like, and this changes a lot that this could have been a different original movie with a few changes. So, the location is different. The name of the bar is different. Like, the profession is different. I'm, like, Patrick Swayze wasn't a professional because UFC and mixed martial arts weren't really a thing back in the late 80s. So, he, to my knowledge, he, he was a black belt in, like, karate or kung fu. And he also had a PhD in something. When he was hired as a um, as a bouncer for the bar, and the bar the bar wasn't called uh, Roadhouse, and it, and I'm pretty sure it was set in Missouri. This one's obviously set in Florida. Jake's an ex mixed martial artist. Time knowledge doesn't have a PhD, and you know, bad guys are a bit different, and you know, there's a lot of different characters. I don't know why it had to be a remake and be called Roadhouse. Like it could have been its own separate movie, and it would have had its comparisons to. Obviously, the original Roadhouse, but it could have been different enough that it wouldn't have been branded a blatant copy because this isn't a copy and it's a remake. So, um, yeah, look, I just wanted to just say that and and leave that there. Uh, I just I'm very big eighties. Just one of those decades where man, it's it's hard to try and replicate that stuff because it's not going to stick. It's, it was a different time. <laughs> um, yeah, there was look, there was some funny scenes in this as well. Like I know Doug um, Lyman can direct some really funny scenes in, you know, more dramatic movies. He he definitely has a good balance for sure. Um yeah, it was a funny transition when Jake first gets to the bar. He looks around, he's like, oh this yeah, is quite good. And he sits down, and has a coffee, a top of coffee he's never tried before, and he's like, oh this is really peaceful. And then it boom, like quick transition to the night time where it's a rowdy bar with a like a a heavier band on. There's brawls and he's kinda like, oh Okay, this is why I've been hired. So that was a funny transition. Also, when the uh, Dell, uh, one of the leaders of the bike gangs, um, they rock up, cause some havoc. Jack takes him outside. He beats the shit out of like six or seven of them. And then he drives them all to the hospital in his boss's minivan, which was quite funny. And they're all in pain and he's smiling driving and he's like, oh, bump. And they, he drives over a bump and they're, they're all kind of groaning in pain. That was quite a funny scene. Um, and Jake does a good job of being that type of character as well. Like, he's serious. You know he's dangerous, but he smiles a lot. He's a smart ass. Uh, and he, you know, pokes fun at people and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, Charlie, the the young girl at the bookstore, very interesting character. We don't see her a lot, but we know that she was going to be an important character from her introduction. And we can tell from Dalton's reaction to her that he likes her and, he also liked the dad as well, and he, and he thinks, oh, okay, like this might be like a, a pretty cool place. So that was some good dynamic there. And Charlie says a scene, um, which she's talking about her dad because he's not at the bookstore because she's like, well, you know, selling books doesn't really pay good money, so he's off doing another job. And then Jake asks where her mother is, and she says, oh, she died last year, and he, you know, does the usual, oh, I'm so sorry to hear. And yeah, then she goes says one of my favorite lines of, of this year so far. She said, uh, shit happens, but it just happened that it happens on... Uh, shit happens, but shit happens on a beautiful day here. And that was like, oh, wow, like, that's such just a great line. Like, you live in those places, it's beautiful every day. Like, it, it, it's scenic. Like, it's shit that you only see in movies or in photographic books. But even... Terrible things can happen in the most beautiful places, which I thought was just a really, really good line. Delivered awesomely. Great reaction from um, Jake as well. Um, and we get 
our first introduction uh, to probably the, like the main villain, like one of the villains, um, Brant. Can't remember his first name now, but he's the son of a like, big drug lord that's currently in prison. And our introduction to him is uh, a few of the bikers that were beating the shit out of by Dalton goes to him, and he's getting shaven by a um, barber. Well, I don't actually think he's even a barber. I think he's just a worker on the yacht. At the front of the yacht on a rough day, and he's getting shaven by a razor blade. So that goes to show, okay, this guy's probably a bit psychotic. He's a bit crazy. And then he has a crack at the captain for the sea being rough and him getting cut. So that's our introduction. That was done quite well. It's like, okay, this is what you're in for with you know, this type of character. He's a typical bad guy, like, Nothing super original about him. You know, it's with these movies, it's, it's two options. It's either about drugs or it's about land. And this is about land. Uh, very, very cliche. Uh, I, Without giving it away, if you haven't listened to it yet or seen the movie yet, a couple of days ago when I covered Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, same problem. Cliche, uh, mediocre, lackluster villain. I mean, a movie is only ever as good as, as the villain. So... It was the same case with this one. Uh, look, that actor did a good job with what he was given. Don't get me wrong. But, yeah, he's a typical villain. Uh, like I said, it's always either about drugs or about land or both. And this was, you know, about land. He wanted to... The roadhouse was the last place that he had to buy so he could demolish it and he was going to build this massive resort af- across the whole coastline. So, yeah, it's, it's a very realistic motive. Like, obviously, land is, you know... We know how greedy some people are and about land and all that. So that's that's completely fine. It's realistic. It's not crazy. It doesn't really, you know, go into any uncharted territory or, you know, anything original either in saying that. But look, it's a realistic motive. Makes sense. It's about money. It's about land. But like I said, nothing original. Very cliche. Um, Yeah, I like the scenes where uh, Dalton, like Jake Gyllenhaal, was sitting back and training up the two younger fellas to kind of be the bodyguards because he, I think he'd only agreed to a month getting paid five grand a week to be the bouncer for the roadhouse. And yeah, it was great him showing the other two things about how to bounce and deal with certain people in certain ways. And he would always step in if he had to, like break some arms and break some fingers and all that. So that was great. Like that was very, very realistic in the business sense too of that happens a lot. You know, there's a lot of jobs and like bouncers and chefs and stuff where they're not going to be in the one place at one time. They're going to move on quite quickly. So you train up other people and you leave, especially if you're experienced and you have a lot to give like Dalton does. So like those scenes, that was really cool. Um, showing us what type of person Dalton is that he can be quite giving. He's, you know, uh, always has people's back and he's on his steps in if he has to as well. And yeah, and the... But probably one of my biggest criticisms would probably be the visual effects. Now, maybe it does obviously this doesn't rely on visual effects much. I think a lot of it was practical. There's you know there's not a lot of need for CGI and stuff. But a few of the fight scenes did have CGI. And what I noticed when so when Post Malone was in the opening scene, when he's actually the original one that's going to be asked to be the bouncer, and they obviously come across Dolan instead because Post Malone uh, refuses to fight him because he knows who he is and he knows he's going to probably fuck him up. Um, he post mine goes for like a punch to finish off this dude that he's fighting, and you can tell that it's been doctored that they've tried to give it more power in the punch with more force in the way that the camera kind of fastly pans from left to right. That was very very clunky. You could tell that it was doctored; didn't look great. Um, there was some chase scenes with the boat and all that that also looked clunky. That didn't look realistic when they probably should have. Uh, but other than that, look, they didn't rely on it too much. But when they did use CGI, you could tell that it was CGI and it did look clunky, unfortunately. Uh, look, although overpaid, in my opinion, at $6 million, Conor McGregor playing kind of like the second tier villain in this. Uh, look, he, he and he always has in his boxing and his UFC careers. Always has screen presence. He's always going to demand demand that you pay attention to him. He's just that's who he is. He's got that energy. Like he's very charismatic. He's going to make you watch him on screen and pay attention to him. In saying that though, his acting was not great. His accent weirdly like 
he still had his Irish accent, but it was like he was putting on an Irish accent. He was like an Irishman putting on an Amer- like an American accent, putting on an Irish accent. Like I don't know if that was his line delivery, and that was how he was coached to act. I don't know. It was very weird, very odd. A lot of his, um, a lot of his lines were like looked not look. They didn't sound rehearsed or anything. That didn't sound natural, if you know what I mean. So it kind of put me off a bit, and he definitely overacted when he had the opportunity to. And look, I don't think that was a bad thing. I think it was a good balance with Brant, like the other villain, like the main villain, was he was psychotic in kind of a quiet way and that he was only going to show his true colors towards the end in the climax. We knew that was going to happen, but Connor was 100% the entire movie. Like, he was absolute psycho. He was a maniac. Um, loved being nude as well, having his shirt off, but that's just Connor in general, I think. And he had his billionaire walk as well that he pretty much used the entire movie, which looked a bit silly, if I'm being honest, in this type of setting. But look, I, I thought he did okay. $6 million for his debut. I think it's broken the record as the highest paid acting debut of all time. Um, so that's pretty crazy. Well, major acting debut. Because he, he's probably, you know, three or four on the call sheet. So he's technically in the main cast. So... Yeah, six mil, crazy, crazy. I don't know if that's worth it. I don't know if you have a lot of people that were like, oh, no, nah, I'm not going to watch this movie. Oh, wait, Connor's in it? Oh, no, nah, I'm actually going to watch this. I don't think there's going to be many people like that at all. I think there's going to be people like, oh, I'm going to watch this. Oh, cool, Connor's in this. That that That's cool. Always going to be people, maybe they'll be like, oh, oh, I might watch it. Or I might watch it next week. Oh, Connor's in it? Oh, yeah, no, nah, nah, maybe I will watch it now. I don't think it's going to completely 100% make people do a 360 and watch this movie. I don't think he's going to be... He's that type of bums-in-seat person for moviegoers. If he was to fight again, you know, it, if he makes his return to UFC, it's, it's going to be one of the biggest returns in combat sport history and probably be the highest-selling pay-per-view of all time, in all, in all honesty. But talking about movies, I don't think he's the bums-in-seat type person. I think if he was to lead his own action movie and it got a theatrical release, I couldn't imagine it would go more than 120 mil. I think it's going to be a massive um, draw. But if he's part of an ensemble cast and stuff, I think he would do great in saying that. I think he'd be good bouncing off other actors. But yeah, look, he, he did, the fight scenes were good. I, I can see why they cast him in this role because Jake has obviously um, had to you know train with boxing and uh, combat sports before with Southport and other roles. So he looks quite natural. And then, uh, you know... With Connor here, they have really great fighting chemistry. And, you know, one of my biggest things about action movies is I love my fight scenes. I've reacted to fight scenes on YouTube for years now um, under my Game of Goose banner. Uh, so, one on one, like combat, you know, hand to hand combat scenes are always my forte. I love watching them, I love dissecting them and reviewing them and looking at the choreography, looking at the cinematography, looking at the act- how the actors go. And look, yeah, they have great fight chemistry. I could honestly watch them fight in a million other movies. Awesome job. You can tell, like, if you didn't know who Connor was and you watched this and you thought, oh, this dude ha- this dude has to be a boxer or a fighter of some description because he obviously just looks great when he throws punches. Obviously, being a professional, you can tell it makes his character look, you know, even more intimidating that he can actually fight. And yeah, him and Jake did a great job with the choreography. I could imagine for both their fight scenes were quite lengthy. So I could imagine the choreography was quite extensive knowing that some fight scenes take weeks or you know obviously a bit more going into with the you know set decoration and directing and stuff but you know Luke Goss and Ron Perlman as Hellboy and Prince Nawada and Hellboy 2 that took like 16 weeks to fully rehearse and film so I can imagine these would have taken quite a long time to do as well uh yeah look the cinematography and the the fight choreography it wasn't groundbreaking by any means but it was looked great it was watchable it did its job. If you're doing a movie about an ex UFC fighter or you know any ex top of fighter, people are going to expect the fight scenes have to deliver. And we've been sold some bullshit in the past with some terrible fight scenes, some terrible cinematography. What I like about this is I can see what's going on, but it doesn't look stagnant. It's it's not just a stagnant camera watching two people fight as if you're watching a real life sporting event with only two camera angles. They do a good job of changing it up. There's some weird like POV shots in there which kind of don't fit because they only do it very minimally. Is that even a word? Minimal? Minimally? I don't know. They do it in the minimum. Bare minimum is what I was ticked with. All right, don't mind for my English, all right? Um, yeah. 
look, and the fight scenes were great. I think a lot of people were satisfied with the fight scenes. If you're wanting to watch this solely for fighting, I think you won't be disappointed, in, in all honesty. Um, look, it's not really a swerve, but it was kind of two options where you knew that something was going to happen that was going to make Dalton snap, that was going to make him stay, that was going to make him fuck up everyone and kind of, you know, make the good guys win. I thought it was going to be the young fellow. I can't remember his name if it was Billy or something like that, but it was the bartender that couldn't make drinks for shit. So Dalton was training him up to be a bouncer and he's a cool kid, blah, blah, blah. I thought he was going to get killed or badly injured and that was going to um, snap Dalton to go onto his massive uh, rampage. I thought it was going to be Connor was going to kill the young fella, but it turned out, nah, he's got beaten up with a golf club and he ended up being fine. It was actually... Uh, Charlie and her dad, their bookstore got half burnt down, but they were in hospital, but they were fine. No life-threatening injuries, and that's what made Dalton snap. But it's kind of weird. I don't don't know if that would be enough to make him snap. Like, after seeing your protege and a kid you like heaps get beaten up by a golf club that he had to be carried out of the roadhouse compared to a shop burning down, but the two people being okay, but in hospital... They're kind of the same, same. So I don't know why, you know, if the dad died or if Charlie died or if Charlie was in a coma or was left scarred or something, that would have made more sense to me. But yeah, because Dalton says, oh, you know, very rarely do I snap, but when I do, I can't control myself. So it's like, okay, so it's going to take something big for him to snap. And yeah, I just, yeah, that's just not would have, that's not just the direction I'd, I would have taken it down. Um, Yeah, and look, when it's revealed, because they they drip drip feed you what happened with with Dalton and what happened to his UFC fight, why he's not longer a UFC fighter, and why he he has the reputation that he has. It was kind of predictable, but the guy that he was fighting, they were actually friends, but he was being a dick to him in the um, pre fight press conference, and then he gets hit with a about three or four fight hit combo, sends him into a red eyed rampage, and he beats the shit out of his friend and ends up killing him. Um, so that was kind of cliche. We knew that was going to happen. I knew that he was going to ac- accidentally kill um, his friend I- inside the octagon. Uh, and like that was predictable and stuff. And but what that what that does is it gives us a really flawed character because it's not. It wasn't really self defense. It um, it was him fucking up. Like he fucked up big time. There was no thing like it was self defense. He killed someone because he was going to get killed. Blah blah blah. No. He's got hit with a good combo and he's got angry and decided to throw seven, eight punches to a granted opponent in the head. Now, if that happened in real life, that happened in UFC or Bellator or Ryzen, like all these big promotions, like that person could be done up for murder or like they'd never, ever fight again and they'll be sued through the absolute ass. So he fucked up big time. People make mistakes and that's why I kind of have a soft spot for this movie in the sense that Jake also does it really well but the way that his character is written is he's a seriously flawed person. He's a really good guy, but he's got anger issues, clearly. And he killed his friend in the octagon, like, because he snapped, because that was the only reason. And it wasn't like he was being bullied or the other dude threatened him or threatened his family. No, he just snapped because he got hit, he got hurt, and his brain just went boom, and he killed someone. And it's because he fucked up. That's um, you know what I mean. Like it, it was his decision making that killed someone, and you know it's weird, kind of cheering for a character that does that. But I guess it kind of shields him in the fact that it was inside the octagon. They both know the risks that shit can happen. You can die in this situation because you are punching each other and kicking each other in the head and other parts of the body. So it's not like he just stabbed someone or shot someone, or you know, it was in a fight. He saw red. He obviously regretted it, you know. So it's kind of, yeah, it kind of goes redemption in the end. It's 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 a very thin rope to uh, walk across when you're doing a movie like this, where you're making your character very flawed in this sense, and if they're going to be likable enough. And luckily for them, he was. So um, last thing I'll, I'll say before I get into my f- uh, final thoughts is. This movie's just over two hours, so with credits, it's about two hours and four, five minutes. So the movie itself goes for just on two hours, pretty much. I think it could have been trimmed down, 
a bit shorter. Maybe an hour and 40 would have been perfect. Maybe an hour and 45 at the most. I think two hours is just a bit long. But that might have been part of the deal as well that they might have had a bit more freedom in the editing room if they went straight to streaming because people can watch at home. They can pause it and go do something or pause it and have tea and then come back and finish it. It's not like the movies where you're there for two hours nonstop, no choice in it. Maybe that's why. But yeah, just a tad long for the type of movie it is. We're seeing that trend now where the average movies now have two hours, which is fucking crazy. Um, I'm enjoying hour and a half movies. I, you know, I enjoyed Baghead. It was a horror movie. Went from an hour and a half, boom, done. Right on the nose, 90 minutes, finished. Perfect. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against movies going for more than two hours. I thought Oppenheimer was a fantastic movie. It deserved its Oscar for Best Picture. Not my pick. I would have picked Son of Interest. But yeah, I think it was... Definitely just a tad long. But some people might agree. Some people might disagree. But anyway, yeah, my final thoughts on the movie. Um, yeah, I I enjoyed it, honestly, for the most part. Um, I It's probably not a movie that I put my, in my rotation to watch all the time. I'll probably watch it in the future. I might do like a double feature night where if I have like mates around or like with my brother and my dad or something, I might watch the, the OG Roadhouse and then watch the remake. That might benefit this movie this movie, I think, because um, they also have the original Roadhouse on Prime now too available, so you can watch both. I think that's really, really good. I think that'll definitely benefit them with people having ma- movie marathons and, and things like that. I think, yeah, the, overall, the acting was good. The, the action was great. Um, and before I get into the uh, my final ratings on the movie, I'll quickly do the trivia. Now, there won't be heaps, but uh, the restaurant next to the to the Stevens Bookstore is named the Double Juice Restaurant, which was also the name of the bar in the Roadhouse. Jake Gyllenhaal underwent extensive training with renowned trainer Jason Walsh to prepare for his role as an ex-UFC fighter. The preparation involved a multi-leveled regimen focusing on strength, conditioning, and nutrition, highlighting Gyllenhaal's dedication to the role. Yeah, like I said, he did an awesome job. Some of the scenes were filmed during the event of UFC 285. Yeah, I do actually remember watching this pay-per-view live and I do remember seeing uh, the hullabaloo about Jake being there and stuff. The filmmakers th- sought to innovate how fight scenes are filmed. The team developed a new multi-pass technique to make the brawls look more, re- more uh, look more realistic, marking a departure from traditional fight choreography. That's what I was saying. Like, they did do a, things different, a few things differently here that you can tell and they did a really good job with that. That's honestly probably the best part about the movie is, like I said, is the fight scene. So awesome work to that crew. The centerpiece of production was the main roadhouse set designed by production designer Greg Berry and then built from scratch from the ground up. Perhaps the greatest testament to the quality of the construction was the fact that the roadhouse set, including its thatched roof, withstood the force of Hurricane Fiona, which blew through the Dominican Republic filming location in September 22. That's pretty cool. I was wondering where this movie was filmed. I, it didn't. It didn't look like Florida to me. Like, and it, it looked like it enough, but I didn't think it was the feel the uh, true filming location. During filming, Jake Dunhall contracted a staff infection after cutting his hand on a breakaway glass. Oh wow, that's nasty. You can die from staff infection. Every fight in the film uses full CG body doubles to the production using a new multipass method. To do seamless punches and kicks instead of faking hits or cutting around the action to be believable. In every fight, the doubles are stitched into the edit for a few frames before stitching back to real footage. See, see, I didn't read this, but I knew that the fight scenes had CGI, and I said this earlier. You can tell. And yeah, that you know, it might be groundbreaking to them, but it doesn't look great unless they really fix up the CGI because it looked clunky, man. One of the bands that plays at the bar is Rock and Dopsy Brothers from Lafayette, Louisiana. Never heard of them, but that's good for them. Director Doug Lyman was drawn to the character of Dalton for being a gentle, caring person who was simultaneously lethal. This complexity made the role appeal- appealing in the reimagining of the cult classic. Uh, Roadhouse was filmed almost entirely in the Dominican Republic, which doubled for the tropical Florida Keys. The choice of location contributed to the film's exotic and dangerous backdrop. Uh, this is the third Roadhouse movie following the original Roadhouse and its director DVD sequel, Roadhouse 2, Last Call. I did not even know that existed, and I don't think I'll be checking that out. <laughs> if it's director DVD in 2006, I don't think it's going to be great. 
Um, so that's pretty much what I will uh, leave on. Oh, well, I've got one last one that sounds pretty interesting. Uh, development began in 2013 with Rob Cohen attached to direct. So this movie's been in development for over 10 years. There you go. I don't... Well, it's over 10 years ago. I was still in year 12 in 2013, but... I don't remember seeing that news. I do remember seeing the news around COVID that this was being made around 2020. So, there you go. So, we'll jump into the final review and ratings for the movie. Now, as you guys know, or some of you might not know, if this is your first time listening, welcome on in. Um, At Goose of... Goose of All Trades, that's actually my other podcast I do, but on Goose Talks Film, that was an accidental plug, uh, on Goose Talks Film... We rate the movies out of five on four different categories, and that goes towards the movie's overall rating out of 20, and that'll go towards the end of the year where I'll do a top 10 and a bottom 10 movies in order of, obviously, what they were rated throughout the movie, uh, throughout the year, sorry. And that pretty much says that that's not going to reflect my personal opinion. Like, if I was to do a top 10 and a bottom 10 list of the movies I watch, but, but just my personal opinion alone, it'd be different. But I'm judging on four categories that I think it's a bit fairer and the less biased I can be. So that doesn't reflect my personal opinion once you see slash hear the, the top and bottom 10 list. So, so don't please don't come at me. And look, it's going to exclude some movies because I can't cover every movie on the podcast. So movies like June Part 2 and stuff probably won't be covered. So they're probably not going to be on the, on the list. So just so you guys know, so you don't come at me. Um, the directing for this movie, um, I'll probably go... A three out of five. It it was quite well directed. I ha- I do have to say, it um I think they were smart to limiting limiting themselves to a few locations for the main story. Uh, we got familiar with certain sets and it looked great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like I said, the fight scenes were great. Um, yeah, it, it was a just you know a well directed action movie. I'll go three out of five. The writing probably not so hot on the writing itself. Like I said, it, just. I feel as though I'm saying this a lot this weekend with Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire as well, but just cliche feel to the fucking gills, this movie. Just, yeah, your typical, like, run of your meal action movie, really. Like, it hits all the beats that you've seen before, but it is fun enough that you can still enjoy it without it kind of just feeling like you're watching every action movie, really. Um, some of the dialogue, yeah, it's not great. I don't think the dialogue uh, and the writing did Connor any help at all. The poor bus, I think, was thrown under the bus a little bit. Just with some of the lines that he was he was um, made to say. Didn't help his acting at all. So, um, yeah. And the, the, the plot was your run-of-the-mill protagonist that fucked up, but he's going to redeem himself. And you got the bad guys that, like I said, are either in it for the drugs and money or in it for landed money. So, yeah, 2.75 out of 5. Probably a bit low of some, but I'm pretty happy with that rating. The acting, yeah, look, everyone everyone did their job. Uh, Jake obviously carried the movie on his back. I think he did a really, really good job. Uh, the villains were good. The supporting cast were great. We don't see a lot of other people a lot. Um, but I thought the goon actors were good. A, a lot of them were quite funny and humorous. I can't remember the short uh, goon's name that had the broken arm in the cast for most of the movie. He was really funny. Awesome, awesome job. Stole some scenes he was in. So acting, I'll have to give it a three out of five. And the cinematography, like I said, that goes along with the um, fight choreography as well. Other than the CGI, v- like very fucking well done. We see what's going on, but it's intense enough that it still feels like you're watching a movie and not watching reality, which is great. So yeah, I'll, I'll do a you know an average three out of five for the cinematography, which gives our final rating an eleven point seven five out of twenty for the year. Uh, yeah, towards the end of the year, I should say. Uh, yeah, look. I'm happy with that rating. It is what it is. Um, I won't reveal any other ratings. The only way you can find out the ratings is by listening to the movies. Otherwise, I'm going to leave it, um, you know, leave it for a bit of a surprise come the end of the year. But yeah, so bring the review to an end here, guys. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you've got this far, just massive props to anyone that's, if you've only listened to one episode or if you've listened to all episodes or even half an episode, I really do appreciate um, I look at the statistics. I see a lot of people listening to the full episode, which really helps me out in terms of algorithm. It really, um, yeah, it just makes me feel good that people actually want to listen to an entire episode of me talk shit. 
for 45 minutes to an hour. So, I just want to, yeah, thank all you guys. It really does mean a lot, all your support. If it's one person listening to a podcast or 100, it it does make a difference no matter how many people. It means a lot. Um, yeah, thank you so much, guys. And, yeah, make sure to uh, check me out on, on my socials, across all socials. I'm Goose Talks Film. And if you're into wrestling, what a wrestling podcast called Goose Talks Wrestling, also on all socials and uh, Spotify and Amazon, as well as, well as Audible and YouTube. And um, yeah, next week, uh, I'm definitely covering uh, Godzilla X-Con and possibly a second movie for a double feature on the Sunday, but that all depends on scheduling and um, the session times as well because it is Easter. So I have a little bit of extra time off, but also busy with family and stuff. So yeah, if you don't listen to next week's episodes, guys, have a great Easter. Have a safe Easter. If you don't celebrate it, then just have a great weekend in general. Thanks again, guys. And as always, make sure that you watch those movies. Cheers, guys.